Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our options, uh, to our market outlook session, a very special one this, this month that we're doing with interactive brokers and a guest uh, that I have here, Steve Sosnick um, from Interactive Brokers. Steve, welcome and thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure as always, Tony. It's great to be thank here. You so Thank you so much. So we have a very special uh, event here for you today where, you know, during the summer, we launched a series called the Market Outlook Series. It was very popular and we decided to bring it back here and do a monthly series where we talk about just the markets because normally we do a lot of events. We discuss educational topics with respect to options trading. We teach you best practices for different option strategies, but adjacent to that is really an understanding of the markets themselves. In order to utilize many of the option strategies, you need to have a directional view. So these are meant as a discussion to help give you a better understanding as to the outlooks that strategists like Steve and I have in the broader markets, discuss the themes that we see in the market uh, in the markets and have a, a a way for you guys to ask some questions about you know how we're currently viewing uh, the the Canadian markets in different sectors that are currently at play especially with the election and the vaccine news that we saw this morning a lot of things moving so today Steve and I were gonna sit down and discuss some of these themes and hopefully provide a little bit of insight and color into the broader market so before we get started what we're going to discuss here today is purely for educational purposes purposes, it is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. Now, uh, my name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. You have seen a lot of my research and my education over the past couple of years with respect to learning how to utilize option strategies. We've talked a lot of, about technical analysis. We did a brief introduction of these market outlook series during the summer, but because they were so popular, we decided to bring them back. And I'm really excited to have Steve join me on the first one of these monthly uh, series. And we're gonna be doing them basically every single month going forward so that you have uh, this regular instance to be able to keep in touch with the broader markets. Now with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give Steve just a couple of uh, minutes to introduce himself and give, you, give, him, uh, give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about his background and uh, his role here at, at Interactive Brokers. So Steve, um, if you wanna just for a couple of minutes, discuss a little bit about kind of your background, especially with, you know, as, as a market maker, because I think a lot of investors, especially uh, retail investors are curious as to kind of the other side of the, of the transaction, if you will. Well, this is a good time because um, so between 1998 and until December, um, I was an active options market maker in Canada despite the fact that I'm physically located in Connecticut, and it's such a beautiful day, I'm actually ha holding class outside, so to speak. Um, but, uh, you know, at, at, at we some, some might argue that I've probably traded more options in Canada than anybody, uh, just by the fact of just having been there so long. So, and before that, I was trading Canadian equities um, at various um, bulge bracket uh, Wall Street firms. So um, I've had a long experience in the markets and I, I do think this is an interesting time because market makers, when you're market making, you really don't want to discuss what you're doing. You, you can't reveal your strategies or your secrets, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's very proprietary. Um, on the other hand, now I can talk about that kind of stuff because I'm not doing it and our firm has, um, has decided to, to move out of the proprietary trading business with the, with the exception of, of currencies and a few selected, and a few selected uh, marketplaces. Um, so that frees me up. That, that's given me a change in outlook and a change in focus from day-to-day -day grinding, let's make sure the markets are open and trading, to I can talk a lot more about what goes into the decision-making behind that process. And then this is the kind of stuff I'd, I'm glad to talk in these formats. And, and hopefully we can, as we go on, we'll be able to exchange those kind of ideas, um, both you and I, Tony, as we have in the past and, and, with, uh, and with the participants. Yeah, and I'm glad to have you here today. So let's start off by talking about, you know, the market reaction over the weekend. Obviously, the U.S. here in the U.S., we have at least the media has declared a winner is yet to be seen as to how the transition will actually work out here over the past uh, the next 78 or 76, seven days between now and inauguration. But there also was some big news this morning about Pfizer's vaccine in terms of the clinical trial and the results of that and markets, at least here in the U.S., have responded extremely positively to 
that, that we have seen that same flow here into Canada. So first I wanted to take a look at XIU, which is the uh, S&P TSX 60 ETF it traded in Canada. The one thing that we did see a little different between the US versus Canadian markets this morning is that the US markets did manage to exceed the prior uh, late August, September highs. The Canadian markets, despite responding fairly positively to the past election results, as well as the news this morning, is still trading below those August uh, and September highs. So not as strong as the US markets, still in my opinion, in this sort of range bound uh, range, if you will, between 24 and 25 and a half here on XIU. So Canadian markets, seeing some strength, but still a clear underperformer compared to the US markets at the moment. Yeah, well, I think the I think part of that comes down to somewhat of the composition of the Canadian markets, and somewhat of the the macro structure. Um, you know, the Canadian markets in general, um, while the while the biggest cap stock is Shopify, which, you know, sort of fits in that NASDAQ mega cap theme that we see leading the US, um, you, you know, otherwise it's dominated by banks, you know, by things like Bell, Bell Canada. They're, they're a bit, bit less, less of a growthy type of na name and also type of names. And the Bank of Canada also is not as... Um, pedal to the metal, let's say, the, as the Fed is. And so you, you throw in that combination and you're gonna see a little bit of underperformance from Canada when, and that's not a knock on the Canadian market so much as just saying the US is, is turbocharged in a way that um, it's very hard to see elsewhere. And actually that is that being said this morning, the, the biggest rallies were were not even in the U, were not even in North America. It was in Europe, which we know is getting ravaged by COVID, and so um, you know where they're actively rolling back. Um, North America, we haven't seen that kind of that kind of reaction, um, partially because things have you know, for for better or worse, we're taking them in stride a little bit better here. I, I don't know if that's the right answer or the wrong answer, but that's you know we're, we're, that's what we're seeing this morning. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and the one thing I will point out here, if you look at the U.S. markets, the, the Dow is actually the strong winner here today. The Nasdaq and the S&P actually not performing as well and giving back uh, some of the gains from the open the same way the Canadian markets currently are. And, and I think, you you know, the, the COVID cases is still very important and very, from my perspective, if you're a U.S. investor invested in U.S. equities, it's still a big gray cloud hanging over us in terms of the performance and, and, and looking out six months and looking out a couple of years as to what this country looks like. Because, you know, and I do want to point out here on the next chart here, if we look at the number of cases here in Canada, if we look at this chart, it certainly doesn't look like a particularly strong chart in terms of the growth we've seen in cases here in Canada. But I do want to put, put this into a bit of perspective here. Canada, um, as of right now, is looking at just a little over 3,500 cases a day. To put that into perspective, that's the same number of cases that New York City, the city itself compared to the entire country of Canada has at the moment. So while this, the trajectory of this chart in Canada is certainly um, concerning and certainly something that I think Canada is going to work towards put, getting under control, compared to the US where we have 120, 125,000 cases a day, this does and, and I don't mean to say 35,000, 3,500 cases a day is by any means small or, or in, insignificant, but compared to the US, Canada does seem to have this under wraps significantly better than the US. Oh, clearly. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get into the po the politics of it, but, yeah. um, you know, when, when you think about this, I mean, on a population adjusted basis, yes, the absolute number is lower, but on a population adjusted basis, Canada is doing much better than the US. Most countries are doing much better than the U.S. Um, I, I don't want to belabor the politics of it. If you've been paying attention to the news, it's obvious. Um, but um, that's you know that's where it's stemming from. And one one other thing, by the way, just rolling back to where the markets are doing best. You mentioned the Dow. Actually, the best market today of the big ones, so to speak, is the Russell 2000, which is up about five percent. So what you're seeing is this hope that. Um, the, the economic recovery will be broader based, um, you know, and, and trickle down to, to smaller companies that had kind of been left behind by this top heavy um, 
call it asset recovery that we're seeing more than anything else. And, and in many ways, I do think that has ramifications for Canada um, because um, outside the largest cap names in, in the 60, especially when you broaden out you know, to the composite and some other stuff, um, you're looking at a more Russell 2000 like um, setup where you have smaller, uh, more economically sensitive com companies and between the bond market in the US and the Russell 2000 in the US, it's telling a stronger economic story. And I think Canada is in a, in a very good position to benefit uh, if this all proves to be true. And there's, that's the big caveat there um, because they're already starting from, from a better place in terms of COVID and, 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 and other factors. Yeah, I completely agree. And if we look at uh, Asia, if you look at um, w whether you track Japan or any of the Southeast Asian countries, or even China, we're seeing, in my opinion, st better strength out, out of those indices than we are seeing in U.S. equities, which, you know, has largely been by far the most, do the, the strongest of all international equities. But we're starting to see some rotation into some of these Asian countries into, as you said, small caps. Small caps is actually, we've seen a rotation of the small caps, not just in the past week, but over the past month or so. And that has really started to accelerate here over the past couple of uh, days, the past week or so, especially with the election, has really kind of poured a bit of fire onto that. But the one thing I do want to point out here, um, and, and this was a little surprising to me when I took a look at this, given, and, and this has to do with the trajectory rather than the raw numbers per se, of you know how the shape of the of, of Canadian um, uh, economic indicators are currently shaping up. Right now, mobility indicators have started to track down for quite a few weeks now to the downside. This is using real-time information, predominantly using um, either uh, these type of mobility indicators usually use um, Google, Anna, Google tracking data or some type of real-time indicator to give us a sense for, you know, are people getting out there? Are they going to work? Are they, you know, going to movies and restaurants and things like that? We've seen a bit of a slowdown here, and I think this speaks to the uh, the rate of which the increase we've seen in terms of COVID cases, but also consumer confidence has really taken a hit along with the Eurozone in, in Canada. So this was actually a little surprising to me when I saw this because just the raw number of cases in Canada is still relatively low on the global scale. But Canada, Canada is taking it at a level of serious, the similar level of seriousness that, that Europe is. They're, they're benefiting because their numbers are lower than, than, than the worst countries in Europe. You know, let's say that, you know, the, you know France, France and, uh, and England, et cetera. Um, but the sort of the level of seriousness is, is uh, in Canada is similar as opposed to, you know, a lot of the US states wear mask, why would I wear a mask? You know, and the problem from Canada's point of view is a lot of the country borders on those states. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've not spent any time in Manitoba, but I can't imagine um, that they'd be wanting anybody in coming in from the Dakotas anytime soon um, with what's going on there. So, and, you know, it's, it's difficult, you know, I, we can't go to, we can't go north right now. Um, I think mm -hmm. I think this is the week that I would have been. I think I was supposed to be in Montreal this week. <laughs> you know, had we scheduled this a while ago, there was a conference. You know, either this week or next week that I was planning to attend. Can't do it. Can't, conference is canceled. But even if it wasn't, I couldn't go. Um, and so, I, I think that I, I think that this is where there's there's the possibility for broader upside in a lot in a lot of Canadian names because of the exact things that because of the exact things that we're seeing in this graph. There's more, there's more room to rally. They haven't already necessarily priced in the, the full, the full post COVID effect, so to speak. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. So I did want to take a look at Canadian 10 year yields because along with US yields, we have seen an uptick in terms of yields well before, you know, over the past couple of months. And the election has has caused a, a, a significant acceleration here to the upside. Um, this, this move actually was more so based on vaccine news rather than uh, the U.S. elections. Um, but we've seen a big move here to the upside. If you look at Canadian 10-year yields currently trading about 78 basis points, U.S. 10-year yields uh, well above that, actually but breaking above the 200 day moving average. So we've had a long-term decline in terms of yields. On the weekly chart, we've managed to break above the 20 week moving average. On the daily chart, we've managed to break above the 200 day moving average. This really 
from my perspective, signals some of the rotation that a lot of investors, a lot of especially Canadian investors have been asking over uh, what feels like almost a year now as far as whether Canadian banks are going to start uh, coming back to life. And, and this is starting to, to provide some of the support for that thesis. Well, you know, certainly, certainly bank, bank uh, profit and loss statements are, are very closely tied to Remember, not necessarily so much the level of the interest rates, but it's but it's the 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 shape of the yield curve. So when you start to see some movement in the long term rates moving higher, um, banks are pretty slow to raise. You are, this is this is no matter where you live, banks are fairly slow to raise the amount that they're going to pay you on on your deposits, but they're pretty quick to raise the raise the amount that they're going to charge people who are coming to the bank for loans, whether it be mortgage or or business loans, etc. And so that does provide a bit of a lift toward um, for banks. It, it gives them a little bit of breathing room. This has not been a very easy climate for them. Um, in a sense, you know, certain banks have sort of had their uh, their loan losses in, in many ways backstopped by very you know by various central bank or fiscal actions, um, which has been very helpful. But that's not constructive. That just removes some of the downside. I think if you do get a little bit of a lift in yields. Uh, that will be constructive for the banks. Um, and, you know, last week uh, on our site, which you can see ID Trader Insight, I'll throw in a little plug there. Um, I wrote about what I called the widowmaker trades. And I was more talking about value versus growth, which has been um, a difficult trade for a lot of people. But to me, fixed income is, you know, I used the example of Japanese fixed income for many years being the widowmaker trades because you, it was this one tailed trade. Yields were never really going to go below zero. There was no inclination from the Bank of Japan to do that, um, but yet people people went broke trying to short the trying to short the Japanese ten year. Um, I think we're in a similar situation in terms of a one tailed trade now throughout mo much of the world. But the question now becomes, and we're starting to see it in, in at least in North America, uh, that the you know the one the one tailed nature of the trade may not be may not be working for you if you're long if you're long long bonds because where are you going to go neither neither the bank of canada nor the us fed seems to have any inclination to go negative i think at the worst of times people might have thought this um, the system is awash with money but if you're looking at a stronger economy and you're looking at a trade that really has very little likelihood of paying off um, in a positive way i think people are People are losing patience with it, um, and I think that's what we're seeing now. And that will that will bring you back to the banks. Remember, remember this old adage: you're earning a lot more money by buying a bank stock and collecting its dividend than you do by leaving your money in the bank. And you do by mm -hmm. you do by using it by by buying the tenure by buying the fixed income that they base their their rate decisions off of. So it does yeah. bode well. Yeah, and for all investors these days that are concerned about valuations and chasing uh, stocks at these astronomical valuations, the, uh, arguably the one valuation that really, um, you, you know, as you say, that you, know, you get more money putting your money in Canadian banks than you do been putting into the bank itself is really the uh, ratio of uh, of equity dividend yields to fixed income dividend yields. Yes. By that valuation standard, we are at. Uh, all-time low or all-time lows in terms of valuations. Um, the S at least here in the U.S., the S&P 500 dividend yield is was at one point almost 10 times the um, the two-year yield. So you know, if we look at those types of valuations, and from an investor perspective, am I going to put my money into a fixed income product or do I want to put my money into equities that yields 10 times, seven times the yield of, of a fixed income product? You know, from that perspective, it's a pretty it's a pretty clear uh, perspective as to you know. Where I want to where where I want to put my money, and and now we've seen this uh, lift in terms of of yields. You know, this might readjust um, that trade a little bit here over the next couple of months. Yeah, and that's putting you know, and that's been putting the floor, I think, in the equity markets. And pardon me, I'm looking off to the side because that's where I'm seeing all my quotes and stuff. And I'm looking here, and I you know, I've got you know, BMO, Scotia Bank, you know, et cetera, Commerce Bank, you know, up. Um, anywhere between two and five percent, and so these are these are good. This is a good day for Canadian banks and, and U.S. banks, um, as well. It should be. Uh, yeah, and if we look at XFN, which is the uh, S and P TSX uh, financials ETF, 
uh, largely underperforming the, the broader markets, uh, having getting rejected at the 200 day multi, moving average multiple times over the past couple of months for the first time managed to break back above that 200 day moving average, potentially signaling a, a, a an event that many investors have been waiting for for a long time since February for the recovery here for financials moving largely sideways, underperforming the broader markets, seeing a little bit of performance. And if we zoom in into a name like BMO, as you had suggested, BMO managing to break back above those August and recent uh, uh, or late November highs around that $65 level, breaking out higher here. So potentially opening this up back into this 72, 70, 72 and a half range here to the upside from a technical perspective. You know, I, I think that this is going to be a, a slow grind here to the upside for these financials. Um, if we do see some further upside, I don't think this is one of these uh, quick, fast moves, especially for those of you that are used to trading wheat stocks or, or tech or tech stocks. And this is going to be a bit of a slow grind here, in my opinion. Yeah, ag agreed. Because, you know, if, if we're talking about the thesis for investing in banks being dividend yield and slow, steady returns, that doesn't that doesn't have a lot of sex appeal. But what it does mean is um, you're in a situation. You know this this is something for a more conservative value investor to be considering. Um, but I, you know the, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with just collecting your check every every three months and you know assuming assuming that it's 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 from a company that that is well managed and and has the money to pay you know has the cash flow to pay for such things and that's where the banks come into play it's it's not yeah. um if you're an aggressive trader banks may not be the place for you if you're a conservative investor um they may be yeah so switching gears a little bit from boring it to something a little sexier something that has moved quite a bit off of the election. And arguably, we've seen a little bit of movement here even before the election is really the response that the markets have had, especially in wheat stocks. Wheat stocks were all the hype in, in 2017, uh, lost a lot of that over the past couple of years. We really haven't heard a whole lot about uh, wheat stocks other than just, you know, from, from time to time, investors would say, is this the bottom? You know, can I start perhaps building a position in this? And, and we've, we've maintained that, you know, this industry is not not going anywhere. There's clearly uh, viability for the industry. If you look at the number of stores that keep opening, it continues to open. Revenues continue to grow in, in Canada. I think uh, in I think it was either August or September, Canada just posted about $240 million in cannabis sales, which is a pretty steady growth month after month. Um, so this is an industry that, that continues to, to um, grow but um, you know the the stocks have underperformed for a long time, and we just might have seen a bit of a reversal here. For we did start to see higher lows on on both the weekly and daily charts. Um, we started to see a little bit of acceleration going into the election, and as some of you know. There were five states that were on the ballot here during the U.S. election. All five states passed all seven um, uh, ballots in terms of legalizing marijuana, whether it's for a medical or recreational. From my perspective, I think the big one was really New Jersey. New Jersey was, uh, I think, from a from a location from a location perspective, um, central to the tri-state area. New Jersey is also. Um, you know, the home of, of legalized gambling or online gaming. So I think this is going to be potentially a, 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 a shift, if you will, for the industry. I don't think this is the game changer that everyone was looking for. I think some, some investors were looking for a Biden victory with a democratic sweep to potentially legalize it on a federal level. I don't think we're gonna get that because we're still likely gonna get a split government here. But in wheat stocks have reacting extremely strong here. And then we've got this big breakout here. So Steve, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to, you know, is this kind of a, a big breakout and a, and a change for the industry? Or do you think this is a bit of a knee jerk reaction? Because, you know, some of these stocks did move quite a bit. I think it was um, uh, Aurora that moved almost 100% in a single day and came back to, to give back most of those gains about down, ended up about 50 to 60% on that day. Um, the answer, I think, to your the short answer to your question, Tony, is I think it's both. Um, I, you know, the the idea that if you want to put a fundamental story behind it, the your your point about going five for five in U.S. state elections uh, tells you that the momentum uh, toward legalization is here. It also means that 
you know, we're still only talking about a fraction of US states, um, mm -hmm. although New Jersey being a large population state and, um, you know, with such, I, let me phrase it this way. I know, I, I, I know of, I don't know personally, a lot of people who go from New York um, and then drive to New Jersey to gamble because the, the online gambling is actually, you know, um, actually does your physical location. You have to be physically located in New Jersey. So there's all kinds of stories of people who on Sunday mornings go, go to New Jersey to place their football bets. Um, I, I don't see why that wouldn't happen um, depending on how the, the rules are written in New Jersey in terms of, in terms of legalized legalized pot, but um, there's still a lot of states left to go. So there's great news. These stocks that have rallied so much, the, the, you know, you've washed out so many people, but the old playbook comes back to comes back in play. Um, and that is, sorry, I have a plane going overhead. If you, I'm sorry if you hear that. Um, but the playbook is, you know, people want to, people, people loved playing in these stocks and there was a lot of money to be made. Um, you know, when my wife's friends who have nothing to do with the market started asking, you know, asking through my wife, which Canadian weed stocks they should be buying. That was pretty much the taxi cab driver indicator in, you know, the 2017 period uh, that we that we saturated the market. Now we're in the opposite situation. These stocks are, are effectively small caps. Many of them have had reverse splits in some in, in cases, um, which is often the kiss of death, but they didn't die. Um, and so you've, if you have a, a lot of money on a fundamental story flowing quickly into a bunch of, you know, small cap stocks, which these are, um, you're going to get outsized moves. That's what we saw. Um, is this sustainable? Yeah, probably. I think for a while this will become more of a, you know, the, the, the news flow, the psychology is behind them. Uh, do, would I be chasing them into these big rallies? No, because uh, that rarely ends well. I mean, yes, it's one of these things that, you know, had you bought, had you bought ACB the first day of the rally and then held on for day two or three, you'd have made a, you'd have made a, a fortune there. But in reality, um, it takes an incredible amount of, I'm going to say, skill and luck and and a, and a willingness to, to bear the fact that if you buy it at the wrong time, you can get clobbered. So. Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a sector that's back in that's back in vogue for the right reasons, at least right now. And and I yeah. think traders should be approaching it accordingly. Yeah, I, I think you know, for investors that are that are looking to that either have a position in this or potentially looking to build a position, one of the ways that you can look at utilizing options to take advantage of this, you know, two strategies that I would point investors to taking a look at are if you own the stock. Look at selling some cover calls. You've had some very strong run-ups. You implied volatilities right now are extremely high. You can collect a fair amount of premium to own, to to um, collect some premium on the stocks that you own and generally generate a little bit more income. And for those of you that are looking to build some positions, take a look at selling some put options uh, at, a, at a level that you're comfortable buying these stocks instead of chasing them. If you're comfortable buying uh, Canopy at 22, sell that $22 put, you're going to be able to collect a fair amount of premium right now because of the extreme volatility. Take that advantage of that, of that elevated volatility. Give yourself the ability to buy the stock at a, at a fairly significant discount to the price that's trading here today as a way to building a position rather than chasing these stocks near all time, near their, their recent highs. And, you know, both stocks, Canopy and uh, Aurora, both also reported earnings this morning, um, which, you know, led to uh, further volatility, if you will, uh, in the stocks themselves. So, uh, you know, if you look at Aurora, Aurora actually managed to break back above the 20 week moving average uh, today and broke above the 200 day moving average here today. So for many investors looking for that reversal, you know, these, these are big moves from these lows, right? So this is a well over 100% move here in the past week or so. That is what you don't want to go chasing. But I do think, as Steve, as you said, this does start potentially, you know, the, the, the reversal here for some of the, the declines. Because, you know, during the one thing I still want to point out is during this period, um, Canadian uh, cannabis sales have grown very steadily. Um, you know, the, the, the two charts of, of cannabis sales to these stocks have been almost in, in complete inverses. And, and I think it was really just this news that the markets 
needed to kind of reprice a little bit kind of what these stocks are valued at. So I, I do think, you know, for, for those of you that are interested in these stocks, this might be um, a time to start looking at it, but be careful about chasing these. And I, and I can't stress enough because you really did bring it back to options in there. This is how option traders think. And that is how do you express your views while capitalizing on volatility? And in this case, um, you know, the one thing I will say about selling puts is you have to be well capitalized. I, I only, I only really want to, st I only really stress ever buying um, covered. I'm sorry, cash secure. Do it. Sorry, selling cash secured puts, because if you sell it on a cash secured basis, it's really, and you really do keep the cash secured. Um, you're talking about the same the same delta, the exposure is the same as owning the stock. If you don't do, do it on a cash secured basis, you are subject to margin calls. So this is, but these are the, this is the strategy that people, you know, that people need to be doing. And that is how do I exploit this when volatility gets rich? Is there a better way? Can I exploit that volatility to my advantage? And, and you've outlined two of, two of the best ways to do that in situations like this. Um, so I do want to turn our attention here to gold because gold was a big uh, item on the on investors mindset last week because gold after a, a strong rally here back in late July, um, some investors caught that some investors missed out um, and gold really consolidated for a, quite some time after that a lot of investors felt that there was a big correction here in gold and that we were just going to continue moving higher that never materialized and gold really just moved sideways for a long time and consolidated and this for from a from a technical perspective is healthy you don't uh, want to see assets to go straight up and keep going straight up those are always um, uh, huge warning signs for for technical analysts so when you see this large run up uh, and a long consolidation period and you start to see a breakout here to the upside, that is usually a good signal for continuation here. But um, the news today on vaccine news brought gold down significantly, one of the big losers here for today. So gold kind of back into this consolidation range uh, between roughly 80, uh, 1850 and about 1950 or 1960 here to the upside. Um, it hasn't broken this consolidation range yet. Um, I think if it breaks below that range, that would be concerning to me that that gold might be continuing to head, head lower, but it has held that 1850 level here to the downside. So um, Steve, for, from, from your perspective, you know, does this change the long-term view here on gold? Or do you think that this is more of a short-term movement here, short-term positioning that, uh, but long-term, you know, when you think about the stimulus that's potentially coming down the pipeline, the concerns that investors still have with, with monetary policy, you know, why, why many investors have been long gold, long Bitcoin, long silver, you know, is that thesis and from your perspective still in play? Um, I think it's in question. I actually did write about it uh, today. Um, and, and one of the things, you know, gold is such a funny, it's such a funny animal because you know, it, it's difficult to, it, it's, it's been a hedge historically, but it's never quite clear what it's hedging. Um, right. I think on, I think right now, the simplest hedge, and I think it's always pretty much the simplest hedge is, it's the anti-US dollar. It's priced in US dollars, and it's sort of the, the inverse, you know, it's sort of the inverse of the US dollar. The problem is it's not even that clean in that respect. It's not like you've got this really great tradable correlation. But I think today it's acting like the anti-dollar. And my reason for that would be the bond markets, as we discussed, are telling you that, that we're looking at the, the potential for a stronger economy. Stronger economy, particularly when you've got very accommodative central banks, lead to the potential for overheating inflation. Yet gold is lower. The US dollar is higher. So I think you're reacting to that. I think Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin, when I, I don't have it up on my screen now, Bitcoin was down about $500 for the same reason. And having had a, an even bigger rally um, in recent in recent days, they've been rallying when gold has been consolidating, and um, you know, so so gold is gold is fluky, and so I think right now, if if the idea is that people were getting into gold, um, th there was there was there was this big anti-dollar trade idea that was out there, U.S. anti-U.S. dollar trade, figuring that. If we were going to have fiscal stimulus, um, we would need to, you know, we would, 
ultimately would debase the currency in some way because we'd be we'd be loading the system up with with trillions of dollars of debt and eventually people would move away from the US dollar i think what as the fiscal as the blue wave idea that was sort of this guaranteed trillions of dollars of fiscal stimulus idea faded that's where you saw that last little pickup in gold um, i think today where the dollar strengthened for all the other reasons that's where you've seen the profit taking today you're seeing all sorts of violent moves it's tough to read much into today you know one way or the other but your, your technical points are, are very clear. And I do think that um, if, we, if we break down further, that does leave us susceptible uh, to breaking the consolidation and calling it a reversal. Yeah, and the, and the one thing to remember is that gold doesn't pay dividends. And I think for a lot of investors are saying that I can, my money is better, is better spent elsewhere, is better invested elsewhere. Uh, we saw a lot of movement here today, whether, you're, whether you want to look at a rotation into banks, whether you want to look at rotation into uh, weed stocks, uh, you know, there's all types of things, you know, pharma stocks, airline stocks, and some of the things we're going to talk about here. I think a lot of investors are saying, you know, my money is better put to work somewhere else. And I think that's part of why we're seeing some of that weakness. And perhaps that's part of why we may not see this rally in gold materialize as strongly as some investors may have hoped uh, on at the end of last week. And as I'm scanning my market, you know, my market minders here, you know, pretty much the worst stock of the day that I'm looking at is is Barrick, um, which is, you know, the granddad, yeah. the granddaddy of the industry of the gold of the gold industry. Um, you know, on a day, by the way, where other commodity based stocks are generally soaring. Uh, non-gold commodity-based stocks are soaring because of the uh, because of the the idea of the reflation trade. So, uh, gold gold is tough. It's it's it's. I guess it's a you know it, it's a good it's a good investment in a sense that it is non-correlating. It's a bad investment mm -hmm. in the sense that it really is non-correlating because because its moves can be kind of random. Um, so it's not necessarily non-correlating in a good way when you. When you want a non-correlating asset, it's meant to be a hedge. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, gold, it's sometimes tricky to figure out what you're exactly hedging with gold. And, um, you know, to me, if you live in a, if you live in a country that um, has some control over its ability to print money and doesn't need to go to foreign, uh, isn't completely dependent upon foreigners for raising capital, and, and the US and Canada are two of those, you know, gold is sort of this interesting sidelight. If you know, if I lived in if I lived in Argentina or something like that, um, you know, I, I you know, where I've got a currency that's really subject to devaluation, um, you know, gold needs to be a major part of your portfolio. But the the group the group on this call, for the most part, does not live in countries like that, and so gold is this interesting sidelight, a fascinating trading vehicle potentially a good investment, but it's it's tough to make too strong of a case for it for all the for all the flukiness that's attached to it. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. For years and years and years, investors and, and, and strategists talk about gold as a hedge, but as you said, it's not it's really not particularly a great hedge for for anything. Um, it, it, and from time to time, over a short period of time, it may be good hedges for certain things, but for largely it hasn't been a strong hedge for for anything really. Um, equities, fixed income, you know, inflation, uh, all of those. The correlations have been um, hasn't been particularly high, and they haven't held particularly strong over time. Uh, but on the flip side of that. You know, from gold moving significantly lower, crude had a strong movement here to the upside. Uh, you know, from my perspective, this I think reflects the, the more of vaccine news rather than anything else, uh, a, a reflection of potentially um, uh, people going back on the road, you know, because they feel safer about being outside. People, uh, this is also a reflection on, you know, the airline industry, which historically is about 10% of crude, uh, of, of global oil demand, um, hopefully uh, more confidence from, from flyers getting back onto planes, um, corporate travel perhaps coming back, you know, as a result of the vaccine news. So crude moving substantially higher. But the one thing I want to point out here is that crude, crude remains a long-term underperformer here um, from, a, from a market and commodities perspective, whether you trade crude itself or you trade any of, any of the energy names, energy still by far the worst performing sector in the broader markets here. 
And if we look at this, you know, from my perspective, crude is still maintains this kind of downtrend that we've been in for a couple of months here. And granted, this, this move up here today was a fairly violent move to the upside, but it hasn't invalidated this down channel here. You know, I would really need to see a, a significant move here to the upside. And from a, from a light crude perspective, you know, 42 has been a major uh, resistance level for quite some time here, ever since COVID that have not managed to break back above, no matter how many cuts we see OPEC um, put together, there, we still haven't managed to, to put together any significant rally here. So from my perspective, the long-term perspective here on, on oil, and specifically if you're, if you're trading energy stocks, is still hasn't changed based on this vaccine news in my perspective. You know, I think the writing is predominantly on the wall for, for, long, for investors, especially if you're a longer term investor as to the future of fossil fuels. Um, and, and if you live in countries like, like Canada, you know, certainly there's a large dependence on that particular sector um, from, from, a, from a jobs perspective. But, you know, many countries, even in Canada, are moving towards, you know, the, 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 the renewables or, or the kind of the future, if you will, of energy, whether that's solar, whether that's um, other forms of renewables, you know, that's where that's where the performance is, at least, you know, from from a technical perspective, you know, we always say we're, we're in the what business, not the why business, right, you know, but and, the reality is that we've seen a shift in strength away from energy and, and fossil fuels into renewable energy. So, um, Steve, I'd love to hear your views kind of on oil overall. Well, I think in, in the short term, we are seeing the knee jerk reaction. Um, you know, I just speaking anecdotally, think of all the people working from home who don't commute to work. I haven't, I've, I've put almost no miles on my car. I'm consuming very little gas. I don't go anywhere. Um, I don't travel on the weekends. Um, you know, you can't extrapolate from one person, but I know I'm not alone in that one. So, so it, it does bode well in terms of demand, uh, the demand picture in the short term. But you know, one of the reasons you saw crude starting to sell off is you, in the US, you, you're seeing a regime change from a president who is very much in favor of the fossil fuel industry to um, someone who probably cost himself some votes by saying that fossil, fossil fuels is something that we need to be moving past. Um, we're not gonna get rid of them immediately. But it's not it's not the wave of the future, and you're going to have active you're, actively, you're going to see things moving away from fossil fuels and toward other sources of energy. It's just you know and fuel efficiency. I think you know one of the things that that kind of got lost in the last administration was fuel efficiency, and that's going to start to that's going to start to return. Um, now, U.S. U.S. is not alone. And I'm looking here, I just pulled, you know, my market minder, you know, you'd mentioned XFN before when talking about the banks, XEG, the energy ETF. Now, for, now we're talking about a $5 number, basically. That's up 17% right, 16.5% right now. But, but the problem is from a very low base. And the other problem I think you have in Canada is many of these junior energy companies, many of the smaller ones, were, which have been great, which had, in the past had been great performers, are high cost producers. And I do think to a certain extent, a lot of the moves that we've seen out of OPEC, the Saudis, Russia, et cetera, have been sort of designed to keep the level of crude below where it's really profitable for a lot of the Canadian producers, particularly the shale producers. And so when you have a high cost producer, you get tremendous bang for your buck when the commodity goes up because you're always sort of on that cusp of profitability and loss. Um, and which is why, again, I think you, you know, I'm looking around, you know, I see like Husky up 20% and, and some of these smaller companies up, uh, up double digits. Um, ultimately, will we get to a level where they will really be sustainably, you know, tremendously profitable? That's going to take a lot of work. And I, 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 and I don't think it's going to happen overnight, certainly. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of demand destruction that would have to be rebuilt um, into the system. And so I think, I, you know, these are, these are a fascinating trade. I, I'm certainly happy for, you know, all the people in Alberta and elsewhere and elsewhere in North America who are, you know, who are looking a little less, you know, flat on their back this morning. Um, but I think ultimately the world is kind of moving away from, from crude and it doesn't bode well uh, for the longer term picture. Um, I, you know, I, uh, we talked about peak crude all these years ago, and I think we, we may have actually 
you know, we may actually see the peak in demand. You know, people, it was always about peak supply, but we may have seen the peak in demand or, or be seeing it sometime soon. Yeah. I, I mean, if we look at just, as you said, the shift in administration here in the U.S., you look at what, what California has been doing with, with respect to efficiencies and what California has been doing with respect to moving towards electrical vehicles. And, and, and the questions that I get these days are, are very, very rarely about energy stocks anymore, anymore the turnaround in energy stocks. It's all about electrical vehicles, electrical vehicle stocks, whether you're trading some of these Chinese names or some of the U.S. names, the, even, even big names like GM, you know, is an electrical vehicle play now. So um, regardless of, of where you are in this particular space, the, the tide is shifting. And I think, you know, moves like this in oil, from my perspective, at least from a technical and, and long term fundamental perspective are more opportunities, in my opinion, to look for short opportunities rather than a shift or a change in, in trend here for, for, for crude or energy stocks. And one so on that thing, front. Sorry, if I may, if I may, Tony, one, one final thing is, remember, you've got money moving toward ESG as well, environmentally, socially, mm -hmm. socially conscious type of funding. We actually set up, uh, you know, a dash, an impact dashboard to see where your investments are going in terms of, in terms of environmental friendliness. These are like the least environmentally friendly companies. They, they are the E and ESG. And, and so these are being actively avoided by an increasing number of portfolios. Uh, that does also not that also does not bode well for them in the long term. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt that one, but I, I, I no, 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 absolutely. I think I think ESG is an important thing to bring up. You know, it's something that we've been talking about kind of in the background for many years, but it is becoming far more mainstream, especially in the past, I would say, year or so. We've really seen this being shoved to the forefront of a lot of investors. Um, I don't know how many investors currently have dashboards that allow them to look at ESG. I know some some firms have started to invest. In that type of, of uh, <laughs> shameless plug division. Um, Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. And and when we look at ESG, you know, at environmental, social, and governance, right? Um, in, uh, energy companies certainly on the on the bottom rank ranks in terms of environmental, but largely from a social perspective, uh, you know, most of these energy companies have not scored particularly well on the social side. Governance, some are okay, some, but particularly they haven't been particularly great. So overall, not, it's not just an environmental perspective, but across the board, you know, energy companies really kind of lagging behind on that front. So certainly, I think a lot of investors that are focused more uh, from that perspective will continue to, to shy away from these types of stocks. And institutional investors, I think, are are paying a lot more attention to ESG as well. Um, so lastly, let's talk a little bit about Air Canada. So similar to the move in crude, uh, to the vaccine news, similar, uh, you know, we've seen a big move to the upside from some of the airlines. Air Canada, one of the big movers out of the airlines, obviously a smaller airline than, than the big three that we traditionally look at here in the US, up uh, almost 25% here. You know, the one thing I will point out here is, you know, prior to to the vaccine news, uh, I was actually quite bearish here on some, on the airlines simply because, um, you know, leisure travel, which was one of the uh, the only uh, components of of air travel that we're seeing some growth, was starting to slow down here over the past few weeks, especially as cases started to spike here in the U.S. Both domestically and international travel was starting to see declines. Even I would argue before, you know, the the, the acceleration we've seen over the past couple of weeks in COVID cases, um, we started to see a decline. Corporate travel remains almost ninety percent below the same levels here last year, seeing no pickup whatsoever throughout the whole year. So especially when you look at legacy airlines um, like, like United American Delta and Air Canada largely, I would say, you know, still falls into kind of that legacy airline category, certainly not that discount, um, you know, uh, airline that, that caters more to the um, leisure traveler was certainly one of the air was certainly one of the stocks, in my opinion, that were to the downside. Now, today's vaccine news, sh huge shift to the upside here. But from my perspective, you know, does that warrant a 25% move to the upside? Because it, it, we, we have to remember the vaccine, even, even if it gets approved today, we're not going to see this. In, you know, people are not going to be vaccinated enough to be feel to feel comfortable enough to get on a plane, and it's going to take a long time for that to happen. You know, uh, Pfizer themselves said they're going to get to about 50 uh, million vaccines at the end of this year, 1.3 billion at the end of next year, and that doesn't account for all the logistics uh, that's required to to get vaccines out to to um, people. So, you know, from your perspective. It, 
I, I'm guessing you're going to say something similar to the wheat stocks in terms of this is a knee jerk reaction, but this also at the same time is a bit of a shift here for, for, for the industry and the sector. The, the one trade I'm kind of kicking myself for not having done when I talked about it, I, I dragged my feet and I missed, I missed it, was I was talking with actually my son and my dad um, about how it was probably an interesting time to start looking into hospitality stocks because mm. the pent up demand for travel is going to be huge. Obviously, I wish I had done it Friday when I talked about it because by this morning it was too late. The other interesting thing, of course, is I can't recall a day where you have an airline up 25% and energy stocks up 17%. <laughs> Those usually don't go together as well um, when you have your, you know, but, but these, are, these are strange times. But putting the 25% move, when you look at it on the charts that you presented, is just a blip. And I think what mm -hmm. you had was people either underowned or short covering, um, you know, or just rushing in, you know, pants on fire type of thing. Um, those are not the days you want to be making longer term investments. Um, but but you're going off such a low base. I I, I do think you have a situation where you know I, I I know markets need to be looking six to twelve months ahead. But the three to six months in between, in the intervening three to six months, it's not going to be pretty. We, we're, you know, we're seeing, you know, COVID continuing to rise. I'm in no rush to get on a plane. I've got a, I've got a kid who lives in Japan. I'm not visiting him and he's not visiting me. We don't want to be on a plane for that long. Um, and, and I also think even when we start to get back to normal, um, ha I think having everybody, having people having gotten there will be this craving to see people and, and we all will and we all want to go someplace, but ultimately will, will people be getting on planes, trains and automobiles to visit their customers as much as they had been doing when to a certain extent they've been doing it quite effectively over platforms like Zoom now. Now Zoom is of course getting clobbered today on, the, on this trade because it's a reversion of the stay at home idea. But um, you know, Again, when we were talking about like highly levered companies have big moves, well, airlines are highly levered. Planes are expensive to, to buy and to maintain. Um, but I think there'll be this, you know, it's not, it's not like you're going to, it's not like this vaccine is going to be rolled out magically, as you mentioned, you know, in three to six months, everybody's going to have the shot in their arm and, you know, and they're going to go off traveling around the world and around the country. Um, it'll take some time. And, um, you know, I think the the twenty five percent move is stunning, but when you look at where we've been and where and all we've recovered and what we've recovered back to, which is a you know fairly low level, still just barely flirting with this with this plunging moving average that we see in the right hand chart, um, it's it's a long way to call it all clear. Yeah, and and I'm glad that you brought up that that story about you know missing out on on the on the the uh, hospitality trade, right? Because I think a lot of investors today will feel that maybe somewhere along along the board, and there's plenty of opportunities where they missed out, right? Where they said I should have went long, you know, wheat stocks, or I should have went long airline stocks a week ago. I should have had this thought that you know we knew vaccine news were going to come out at some point, right? And and I think that's a good perspective to bring because. Even as strategists who, who, you know, this is what we do for a living, they're all, we miss out on opportunities all the time. You know, I said to myself the day after the election, when I saw Aurora was down 10%, I, I said to myself, you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, these, these five states just legalized weed. Why is the stock down 10%? And I thought to myself, maybe I'm missing something because my first thought was maybe I should buy this stock. And then, and then I said to myself, maybe I'm missing something. And I didn't. And the next day it shot up 100%, 200%. Um, and, and I was kicking myself. And I think that's just, a, you know, a good, good perspective to bring to any investors that's on this call saying to yourself, you know, I missed out on some moves today. That's okay. You know, there's plenty of opportunities in the market. So don't be, don't be hitting, uh, beating yourself up because you missed out on some opportunities today. If anything, today validates perhaps a, a shift in, in the direction or the, the shift in the wind in terms of how investors are going to be thinking about some of these reopening trades. And as you said, the moves that we've seen, while spectacular, is a blip in the radar considering the, the grand scheme of things. So I hope that that helps provide all investors here on this call today a little bit 
of, of a not only a short term perspective, but much longer term perspective into how you position um, going forward. And I hope that this is giving uh, everyone a little bit more perspective. Now, I know we just have a few minutes here. Um, so I do want to wrap up with talking about, you know, the big stock here in Canada, Shopify, which had obviously the negative reaction here to the downside um, with, as you said, the reopening trade Shopify taking about a six, six and a half percent decline here today. Still, you know, within this range here, I, I, I don't necessarily know that this shifts the fundamental picture of Shopify significantly per se on this vaccine news. I think people are still going to continue to, sh to shop online. I think the trend of e-commerce has been in place for years before uh, the coronavirus, but the coronavirus simply poured fuel on the fire and Shopify certainly at the forefront of this is currently still trading within this range. So from my perspective, you know, if, if you're the type of short-term trader, look at this as a trading range and an opportunity to perhaps look for an opportunity to, to trade within a range and, and then still seek long-term to see if it breaks out either to the upside or to the downside for your longer-term views here is the way that I think I would look at Shopify. And Steve, I don't know if you have anything to add here on Shopify um, before we end here. I'll just be relatively brief because I know we're, we're, we've spent a lot of time on a lot of things. I mean, Shopify, as with like Amazon and some of these other companies and you know, you mentioned this, we've, they've accelerated a trend that's already in place. The, the problem with a Shopify, while their business remains excellent, it is really highly valued as, as are most of those other companies. Um, the flip, you know, that's the flip side of these, uh, of, of high valuation or, or high leverage as we discussed earlier. Um, you know, there's a lot of room for disappointment. I mean, look at where Shopify's come from, look at where the moving average is. Do I, do I see it breaking down immediately? No, nope. but do I see it, you know, but we're, we're, we're kind of flirting with this. Actually, I just checked in. Since we've been on the call, Shopify is now down 9%. So the, the losses have been accelerating a bit. Um, there's so much, there, you, it'll be interesting. I think, I think one of the things that benefited some of these very, very highly priced stocks, uh, you know, Shopify, I'm including in this list of US stocks because it's, a large U.S. ownership as well. Um, I think you had some pr some pressure on them uh, going into the election because there was this fear that uh, that a blue wave would mean that there would be capital gains taxes going up next year, and people were sort of edging away, at least from putting. You weren't they weren't necessarily selling these high flying stocks, but they were sort of edging away from adding new money to them. Um, and I think they sort of saw what I would call an all clear after the election, and now it's reversing that all clear a little bit in certain names because of because of the stay at home trade. Um, Shopify is not a cheap stock. It's a it's a great company, yeah. uh, but it's not a cheap stock. And 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 there's been a lot of money made in it. And you really just have to decide are people are enough people going to say this is time to lock in some lofty gains. And if you're not in it, is this is this the time you want to be entering it? I think there are some option strategies you can be um, engaging in that, you know, that play the potential for a bounce or a breakdown, um, but but these it's a, it's it's a tough name to trade in here. Yeah, and I think that if you're going to pursue this, you know, options certainly is one of the ways that I would look at playing this from the perspective of I want to limit my risk, right? Um, with a name like this, uh, especially if a break, if we do get a breakdown, I think there's significant downside here uh, if you do get a breakdown here. So if I was to play a bounce, I would certainly use some type of spread to make sure that the risk that I'm taking is a relatively small percentage of the actual stock price. So if it does break down, I'm risking five, seven percent of the underlying stock price to, if I was trading some kind of spread, whether it's a debit spread or selling a credit spread. Those are the types of, of plays that I think if I was playing Shopify, I would use those types of strategies. And, and specifically, um, OK, here's the market. Here's the market maker tip of the day. Um, if you do go to trade Shopify options, you might say, well, these are these are wide spreads. Um, you know, on a huge on a huge number like that, you do see what tend to see wider spreads in the options. Don't be, don't buy on the offer. Or don't sell on the bid if you don't have to. Try the middle. Try the try try somewhere in the middle first. Figure out what the the midpoint is. The option market makers fair value, and you know, depending on if it's a high delta, it may not be perfect. But for the most part, that's where they value the options. Market makers. Um, really what they want to do is sell stuff above their fair value and buy below their fair value. 
And so what you want to be doing in a situation like that is splitting the difference. Maybe, you know, say, okay, well, they're not going to sell it. They're not going to sell it below their midpoint. They're not going to buy it. They're not going to buy it above their midpoint, but they might be willing to split the difference with you. And in terms of spreads, particularly when you've got, you know, when you're trying to spread two options with a fairly wide spread, um, shameless plug division, again, you should be using a broker that allows you to enter spread trades as one continuous trade inside the bid ask. And so you set your limit. You'll see that the, the price for whatever, if you're going to do a vertical, uh, whatever it is, you know, vertical, a straddle, a strangle, et cetera, um, you see it as one individual trade with one, with one accumulated bid ask. And then you place your, then you place a bid or an offer as appropriate inside that spread. You will save yourself some money unless you're trading really huge size. The market makers are not going to run away from you. They don't. They want to. Tra they want to trade with small lot traders. You know, especially if you're putting in orders, let's say ten or below. They want to trade with those orders. They, they're going to go out of their way to do it. So that's what you should be doing, as you if you're considering, <clears throat> if you're considering doing uh, spread trades or any or even outright trades in um, in names that have a fairly wide bid ask because because of the combination of volatility and stock price. And I think I want to point out something very important that Steve said, which is the midpoint is how the is for all intents and purposes, how the market, what the market maker determines is the fair value of an option. Think about the bid and ask quotes as kind of the uh, the sticker price that you that you see when you walk onto a car dealership, right? When you walk into a car dealership, you see that sticker price. You you know you don't want to pay that sticker price. You know you want to negotiate what the price is. The problem with a car dealership is you see that sticker price, but you don't know what the what the dealer paid. You don't know what the fair price is. So you're kind of uh, figuring that out as far as negotiating where you start. But when when you have both a when you have a two way market, when you have a bid price and an asking price, the midpoint gives you some indication as to what the fair value is. And that's where you start your negotiations. Think of the midpoint as the fair value of something. And if you're trying to buy it, you always buy, you want to price it a little bit higher than the fair value so that the dealer, if you will, feels that he's getting a deal and he's he's able to make a profit and you're able to get a price below the sticker price. And same thing if you're selling, think of the mid price as kind of the fair value and he and and the dealer wants to sell it to you at, um, at wants to buy it from you at, at a slightly lower price than what he perceives as a fair value. So use that midpoint to your advantage. This is this is one of the benefits of a two-way market. It really allows that fa a fair amount of transparency to you as an investor, and and take that take that knowledge to to um you know to your advantage. So with that, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up and just talk a little bit about what Steve just said. You know, the two I would say most common. I, I, I'm going to call it complaints that I, that I get from Canadian investors are, are really two things. One, the ability to trade multi-like options from most from any of the Canadian brokers. And number two, the cost of trading options at the Canadian brokers have, you know, many of you have sent me so many emails over the past couple of years asking me, how do you trade multi-like options? And how do you trade, uh, you know, when, when you're trading something like a, selling a cover call for 40 bucks, how do you make that economically viable when you're paying 10, 12 bucks in, in commissions. So I do want to give Steve a, a, just a minute to talk a little bit about interactive brokers because it is one of the few brokerage firms in Canada that allows you to trade multi-leg options and from my perspective at a very cost-effective rate. Well, you pretty much said what I was going to say. I mean, I think the, the advantages, the, the advantages are, are, you know, are, well, first of all, you know that we we have this great product breadth and international breadth that, that you don't necessarily get elsewhere. But in terms of very specifically the Canadian marketplace, uh, you know, beside so number one, you get access you get access to the world through through one account. But very specifically in terms of M Montreal listed products, um, we tend we tend to have if not the lowest commissions among the lowest commissions. And we have what I consider a, a real advantage in terms of technology in that you can trade, you can trade spreads with one click. Well, you got to set them up. It takes a couple of clicks, but your bid and ask are one click. You, you know, if it's, if you see that the combined bid ask is 10 to 10 and a half on some particular spread, you can then bid 1035 and see what happens. And, and you, 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 eliminate the risk of having to leg into a having to leg into a spread which can be difficult if you get one leg filled and the other not, not filled then you have an outright position that you didn't necessarily want 
So th those are the real reasons why I, I, I feel strongly why investors, active, uh, active options traders should be considering our platform. Um, so a couple of questions about the IB, you know, for multi-leg strategies, do I get charged per leg? Um, yes, but, it, and, and I do understand right now that there is, but again, if you're getting charged small amounts, um, you, you know, that, and the, and, and if you're able to tailor your execution price, that more than offsets the difference in executions. You know, as I'm looking at the questions coming in, somebody mentioned there's no assignment fee, which is nice. Uh, but, and I will say that between the, the, the new, you know, I, there's the various IBKR Lite and IBKR Pro, it can be a little bit tricky in terms of understanding the, the pricing and fee structure. So I, just, I do see that comment in there. Um, but the one thing I will say is pretty much across the board, um, we are really competitive in, in price, in pricing and um, in, in pricing and, and, and complications, you know, thereof are relatively minimal because no matter what you do, it's generally going to be a pretty good, it's going to be a good transaction cost. Um, Steve, do you have a couple of minutes for answering some questions? I certainly do. I see them. I see several in the Q&A, so I'd be happy to, uh, to address the ones I can, sure. Okay, let's take a look at Wallace. What's your view on Canadian energy and pipeline sectors such as Enbridge? I don't know if you want to talk about specific names I, here. I um, really but... can't talk about specific names. Okay. Um, you know, Enbridge is, is Enbridge is a very interesting political uh, situation in terms of the pipelines going through. And I, I, it's not my mandate to talk about individual stocks in a detailed way like that. So I really can't give you a better answer in terms of Enbridge. Um, Suffice to, other than what we've more or less been saying, it's a beneficiary. It, it benefits. It benefits from some of the trends we've seen in energy. Um, but in terms of the specific politics in the U.S. states involved, I, I, it's out of my, out of my pay grade, I guess. Yeah, for me the same thing. But what I can add is just from a technical perspective, you know, the news or, or the, the, you know, again, I'm not in the why business. I'm in the what business. How have markets reacted to the news, right? Because the news is out there, the the, the views are out there, and the markets haven't reacted particularly strongly. If you look at ENB, still in a strong downtrend here. Um, you know, the move to the upside, while while strong, hasn't broken this downtrend here. If you see a breakout of the downtrend, then I would say you have a thesis or perhaps the legs of a continuation higher up here. But from my perspective, it's the downtrend remains intact. And I think the opportunity is more on the short side rather here to the upside. Um, thoughts on Canadian banks or defaults, uh, given that Canadians have one of the highest personal debt ratios, 165% higher than the US. So this is a question that I that I've been getting a lot with respect to um, the the rotation into that bank, into the banks, right? So we've talked about the uh, move in rates. We've seen the same move in U.S. banks, especially if you look at regional banks in here in the U.S. We've seen that move here to the upside. Um, and and alongside that question is really the 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 added risk that you now have with potential defaults, whether it's you're talking about mortgages or personal loans. There certainly is a, a quite a bit of of risk, in my opinion, and, and I'm not sure that that risk is completely um, priced into the markets just yet because you know. A lot of mortgage defaults have been pushed out, um, whether it's due to, to uh, state or federal laws. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure of the, of the, you know, the policies here in Canada, but certainly um, that is a risk. And, and from my perspective, the way to think about that is that the risk is there from, from the upside in terms of the banks. The, and that's part of the reason why for me to play the upside here in banks, I'm using an option strategy to do so. I'm using either a spread or a calendar or a diagonal to play for the upside in the banks because I do see that downside risk. And I want to define that risk or reduce that risk by using limited risk strategies. So that's how I've been dealing with that, but because I completely agree that that risk is there. Yeah, I think you summed it up really well. I mean, there's um, the, you know, the one thing I will say on behalf of the Canadian banks is um, they've always been um, so cautious, even so I do have to believe that um, even even with the even with the high uh, personal debt ratios, they're probably pretty good about managing it. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're are uh, pretty well diversified, 
geographically within Canada for the most part. There's certain uh, certain ones that are, you know, more or less diversified within within regions. Um, but you've got some reason, regional diversification, um, and in many cases, you've got international diversification depending on the bank. Um, you know, which I, I find interesting. For example, you know, Scotia and, and BMO up today so much. You know, being being having big presence um, outside the country as well. So um, I, I wouldn't sweat it too much, but that is laying there in the background, and I do think that both adds some downside risk and hampers your performance somewhat. Be in, in in the short term. Yeah. Um, the next question is about the airline sector, but we have covered that. Um, I think the question was, are these close your eyes and just buy stocks? Um, I, I think we've kind of answered that before. And the answer is no, we, we don't believe that it's uh, close your eyes and buy these stocks just because that the, you know, these are uh, for all intents and purposes are what we call too big to fail, um, you know, that's a term that we usually reserve for banks, but you know you could kind of say say that for for some of the the airline industries in terms of government bailouts because airlines historically you know basically go bankrupt every twenty to thirty years and the government step in steps in to, to bail them out. We've seen that in here in, in the U.S. Um, and largely, I would expect Canada to to do the same thing with Air Canada and WestJet. But it looks like you know today's news maybe reverses some of that a, a little bit, but. I, I, I don't think that this changes the financial picture for some of these airlines over the next two years or so. Um, so I, I do I, I do think that you could see a little bit of weakness off of this knee-jerk reaction um, over the next few weeks. Someone once said, and I think it was Warren Buffett, but I'm not sure who it is exactly, said the fastest way to become a millionaire is start with a billion dollars and buy airline stocks. <laughs> I think there are no close your eyes and buy airline stocks. I think there are tactical times to trade them, uh, but that, that'll be the short answer to that question we've covered so much of already. Um, what are your expectations on marijuana stocks from now until January when Biden goes into the White House? Um, good question. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I, from my perspective, I, I prefer to be a bit of a contrarian off of these knee-jerk reactions that we've seen, whether it's due to the election or due to the vaccine news. I think that, yes, there's there's a lot of, as, you, as, as um, Steve put it, kind of um, uh, movements on some of these smaller cap names, whether you're looking at marijuana stocks or, or even some of these airline stocks. Um, but you know, it doesn't fundamentally shift the picture overnight and it's gonna be a slow grind here to the upside. So I think marijuana stocks moving 100, 150% to the upside, I think personally is a little too far too fast and you're gonna see some of that give back a little bit. I think really for better or worse, the key is gonna be the, the question of how much they capture the public's imagination. If they capture, you know, if, it, if they come back into play again, um, you know, where they were a fad before and they can be a fad again now. And, um, you know, and, and I, I think someone in the chat mentioned HMMJ and this applies to that too. Um, I, I think, you know, they're faddish type of stocks, faddish, F-A-D-D-I-S-H, you know, they, they become, you know, they get in, they get out of play. Um, you know, I, I I wish I could say they move more in fundamentals. You pointed out earlier that that canopy was falling as their sales, you know, despite sales growth. They they move in their own little world. Um, they're very idiosyncratic. Uh, they're very subject to per people's whims. Um, does that mean you shouldn't trade them? No, they're fun to trade. But does that really make it really makes it incredibly difficult to figure out a fundamental call about them? Yeah. Um Dominic is asking about Pfizer options. Now we're not here to talk about US stocks or options here. Um, so I'm gonna decline on answering that specific question, but I will provide some insight in terms of, you know, think about the vaccine in terms of just because a vaccine has a good clinical trial does not mean that the, the, that the distribution is going to happen very quickly. Um, you know, think about, you know, how much revenue or profits can they actually make from that? Um, you know, how much is it going to be and how big is that compared to what they currently make? In, in reality, most of these is not, they're, they're not going to be huge money makers for some of these, these companies. And then there are a lot more other companies working on vaccines as well. So 
you know, from my perspective, I, I, I don't think it's as, as strong of a thesis as some might think. Um, Jack, Jack is asking a question. You had talked a little bit about, you know, the small cap uh, energy producers and, and, their, and their high costs. And he's asking, do you consider VET as a small producer with high costs? I'm not familiar with that name, and I don't know if you're able to comment on that. Um, I, 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 I'm familiar with, with VET Vermilion, but it's not, um, it, I, don't, I, don't know off, I don't know their cost of production offhand. Um, just looking at the stock price you pulled up, I think it kind of answers the question for us that it would that it would be considered a higher cost um, producer that's you know uh, finding some financial issues that's found some financial issues as did many. It's not it's not a knock on them. It's a, more of a more of a knock on the industry, um, not a knock on them. It's just a facet of it. But I would say that without knowing of VET's cost of production off the top of my head, I think they fall into that, um, I think they fall into that framework that I was referring to. Yeah, and just one last question before we wrap up here, a general question, Canada is such a small market compared to the US. Does it make more sense to just focus on the US with this high liquidity versus the Canadian markets, which has a, com which has a concentration of companies in two to four sectors, thanks. So uh, I'll take a first shot at this. And, and you know we actually did a lot of comparisons of US versus Canadian uh, options from a liquidity perspective. And a lot of, you know, a lot of times when you look at the bid ask spreads of Canadian companies that are interlisted between US and Canada, we actually see smaller bid ask spreads in many of these Canadian names versus when they're interlisted here in, in the US. So that's one thing I will point out is that, you know, when we talk about liquidity, sometimes, and this is something that Steve and I, you know, I've been talking about for quite some time in terms of how do you measure liquidity, the bid ask spreads are far better in terms of helping you gauge liquidity of an option or, or a company rather than using open interest or volume. Many, many investors look at higher open interest in, in, in the US and, and believe that there's uh, better liquidity. And that's not particularly true. The US is just a much larger market. There are far more participants trading those instruments. In the, in the Canada, you know, some of the uh, names actually have better liquidity in the Canadian markets. If you trade BMO, for example, you're going to find that the Canadian BMO options are more liquid than the US BMO options by far. And this is something that's maybe surprising to some Canadian investors, but we have been doing this research and we've been trying to, to talk about this. So don't be so um, fast in making conclusions that the U.S. are just more liquid than Canada. And, you know, at the end of the day, you, you're living in Canada. You have more exposure to Canadian companies just from a day-to-day -day perspective. You might have a better understanding of Canadian um, companies from that perspective. And your, your brokerage firm may provide better research and coverage on Canadian companies than U.S. companies are. So from my perspective, I, I think you want to use both markets, you know, don't, and don't be so, so fast to discount the liquidity of Canadian markets. And I told you the secret for finding the liquidity and that is it's there. They're just put bottom line is this, it, unless you, unless you're trading large orders and I'm saying 50, 100, 250. And even then, if you are, you, you should have a relationship with a broker who, you know, can handle that kind of stuff. But, um, I'm assuming most of you are trading smaller orders, you know, somewhere in the, ten, you know, 10 to 20 or, or lower range. There's sufficient liquidity to do that. You're not going to, you're not going to push the market making community off the prices. If you try to, if you try to trade relatively small amounts, they will, they will trade with you. Also the ones that are interlisted, those market makers can source the liquidity in the U S if, if need be, although as Tony mentioned, a lot of the bigger cap ones, there's the liquidity. It goes the other way. You people who want to trade the options in the U.S. that finds that the market makers are, they're sourcing it the liquidity in Canada. Um, do not do not be put off by that. And uh, the the antidote to what you're seeing, if you think it's a wide bid offer spread, is nobody tells you you have to trade on the bid offer spread. Put in you know put it in, put it in inside the market. Um, if you put in an order for an eight lot, you're not moving the market maker. He's not moving his price. He, he'll, he, you know, if you're close to his bid or ask, he'll probably fill you. He's not going to necessarily move as a result of this. And again, remember, market makers want to trade with smaller players, particularly when they are paying above the fair value or selling below the fair value. It doesn't have to be on the bid ask. They want the bid ask, but that doesn't mean that's where they're going to necessarily, that's not necessarily where they're going to trade it with you. 
Yeah. Just remember the bid ask price is the sticker price. Think about when you walk into a car dealership, do you play that sticker price on the window? You do not. You always try to negotiate. Same thing with market makers. And the benefit here is that you actually have a clear sense for a relatively clear sense of what the fair value is. So you know where your starting point is. You are at advantage from that perspective. Um, so with that, you know, Steve, I just want to thank you for taking the time out here today. You know, this was from my perspective, a fantastic um, time to be able to talk to you and, and pick your brain a little bit as far as how you think. And I'm glad that we covered so many sectors, so many different industries and being able to cover the election, the, 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 the news this morning, which was a bit of a game changer for, for some investors. So thank you so much for your time here today. It was my pleasure. I, I, I love doing these webinars. I love being able to, to talk to people, get, you know, hear their questions and, and just we, we covered a lot and I look forward to doing it again, Tony. Thank you so much, Steve. So today, what we will do is send the recording after we finish here today so that you can review them with the slides. We will send you the link to, to if, you, if you're interested in opening up an interactive workers account uh, to, to take advantage of some of the things that we discussed here today. So thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time out here this afternoon. Like I said, this is, this is not replacing the regular educational webinars that we do. We'll still continue doing that. But we want to make sure that we keep adding these market outlook sessions to for you going forward so that you also have a way of understanding more about just the market, um, you know, the, the current market environment and just providing a little bit of color on the different uh, names and, and sectors that you can trade. So thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time. I hope you guys have a great trading day and I'll see you guys next week. See you, everybody. Take care.